What's up, Internet? John here from NextGen. Welcome to the very first edition of the Great Canadian Gear Guide, a series in which we'll highlight some cool gear and occasionally have conversations with cool people involved in the gear industry in Canada in some way, yeah. even if it's in a distant fashion. Um, our very first guest is a bit of an Internet legend, albeit reluctantly. Uh, Mark is a research psychologist, actually, who's been building and modding pedals and amps and guitars since the 70s. Uh, For pedal builders, he doesn't need much of an introduction in terms of his influence on the industry. His name is often thrown around with the names like Jack Orman and R.G. Keene. Uh, As a person, Mark has always been extremely generous with his time and knowledge, often sharing both freely in person and online, more or less since the dawn of the Internet and the Internet forums. Yes. So... Once again, he's proven his generosity by coming here and being with me today. So, Mark, thanks for coming to NextGen. Thanks for your generosity and asking. I apologize for the funky camera angle. We're social distancing, so <laughs> we got to keep our distance. But, uh, And I appreciate you coming in despite everything going on right now as well. Um, I got a whole lot of questions that I've prepared, and we, I pulled some from people who have knew you were coming and wanted oh, to, had okay. various questions for you. I'm going to start off with a really odd, but maybe a simple question. You're a psychologist by trade. Yeah. That's what you're trained in, and that's what you ended up in. Yeah. Um, how, how did you end up getting involved in pedal building and, and circuitry work and things like that? Well, I, gu- I guess there's, there's uh, two or three paths um, that, that seem to converge. Uh, one is that uh, being a student for as long as I was, um, I couldn't afford to buy a whole bunch of stuff new. Um, and uh, so I would try and make stuff on my own. Mm. Uh, as it happened, in uh, the 70s and the early 80s was kind of the golden age, uh, at least the first golden age of uh, DIY in, in the pedal game. And uh, Craig Anderton uh, graced us with uh, uh, books and many columns in in multiple magazines. He runs a magazine now too, doesn't he? Uh, Wasn't it uh, Electronic Musician? He he has, well, he was the editor of Electronic Musician for a while. Uh, Now he's got, he's he's involved in a lot of things, not just recording, but uh, publishing and... Uh, he also does documentation for a lot of software companies and gear companies. In any event, yeah, I apologize. <laughs> no, that's okay. Um, trust me, I'll throw in enough of my own detours. <laughs> uh, but I also learned uh, lots about, um, how would I put it, signal chains uh, in the course of my training in psychology. So... Uh, the, uh, as I'm fond of pointing out, the very first uh, FET preamp I ever made was built into the head of a rat, <laughs> so that we could get uh, so that the little tyke could scamper around, and we could get uh, good um, uh, brainwave recordings uh, so about forty the feet away. Waves? Well, with mostly buffering. Okay. Okay. Um, high impedance source, you know. So <laughs> yeah, we need we needed to buffer so that the uh, compute the the uh, A to D converter on the computer forty feet away could get a, a decent signal. And also, uh, when I was an undergraduate at McGill, uh, I was learning how to do work. Um, a polygraph, uh, not for lie detection or anything, but just for recording uh, heart rate, blood pressure, things like that. And you learn a lot about uh, gain staging doing that because you've got your preamp and your pen driver amp, and so you got to filter things and you got to set your levels just right. And it's uh, it's not a whole lot different than setting your gain and master volume on an amplifier or on a pedal. So you, you pick up little things along the way that, that help. It's interesting, too. Uh, I've even experienced that. When I started get, get, getting into this stuff is kind of... If you've never learned electronics before or been involved in it at all before, it's really hard, actually. Uh, or at least it certainly seems very daunting because it's a brand new language. It... it a lot of it is counterintuitive. Like you would think it works this way, but it actually works the exact opposite of what you, the way you think it should. Um, 
Oh, and, and much like mathematics, statistics, computer science, and anything that's quantitative, it's usually taught by the very worst people <laughs> to teach it. People who understand it deeply, yes. but aren't, aren't, aren't really great. skilled at conveying it. Yeah. Well, and that seems to be a skill you've developed over time. Is one, the, the, the one thing I've, I saw when I was getting feedback or finding feedback about you, because, uh, I mean, you've been all over forums for a long time. There's no shortage of posts either from you or about you from other people. Uh, and a really common theme is that you're not only are you incredibly generous with the things you've learned uh, that you're sharing with everyone, but also you are a very good communicator. Like you take complicated concepts and you are able to express them in a way that people who are learning about this stuff, like it's like, it's like you're able to get the light to click on for them. The, and people, uh, yeah, I think that's the, the biggest part of whatever reputation I have. People think I know more than I do simply because whatever I, I do know, I can explain well. And mm. people are very uh, appreciative of that, particularly if they're coming off of uh, textbooks and... Uh, yeah the usual sorts of folks who teach electronics and uh, computing. Um, I, I have basically two people that I model myself after uh, when it comes to, to explaining and teaching. Um, one is a guy at, I think, Tufts University named Robert Sternberg, who's a... Uh, a, a well-respected intelligence and personality theorist, and he always starts off with an analogy that makes sense to everybody in the room. Mm. And all you're going to do after that is just give it some fancy names. And he <laughs> he tries very hard to convey that y you know this stuff already in your in your everyday life. You just need to put the words to You need to put the, the words, words and yeah. tie things together. And I guess the other example, uh, I, I had the good fortune many years ago to be seated beside Carl Sagan. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, it was quite by accident, I assure you. And, uh, you know, I asked him, um, how, how is space is so vast? How can you, like, possibly imagine it? And he says, well, you know, once you've been studying it long enough, he says, it starts to feel like a neighborhood. You know, you, mm. you just go to Alpha Centauri, you hang a left, and you can't miss it. And you learn the power of uh, analogies and sort of uh, mental models that, that people have an intuitive grasp of. And, what, you know, once you've flagged sort of that starting point for them. The rest is is fairly easy. Uh, people get traction uh, yeah. quickly uh, when you start Once that way. Once they can way. connect something to it, yeah. the concept is easier to yeah. understand. Um, so, I mean, that one of the quotes from R.G. Keene, actually, about you oh, geez. is that Mark, I'm going to puff yeah. you up a little okay. bit here, uh, Mark is perhaps the best thinker about how people relate to effects and how to use them. Uh, so I'm curious, your training is in psychology. Yeah. Um, how do you feel, how do you feel the way of thinking that you learn through s training for being a psychologist, how do you think that the way of thinking about that transfers over to the way you're thinking of other things like either your relationship with gear and your relationship with, uh, potentially circuits? Um, Thanks for asking that. Uh, um, that that's a part that's Im important to me. Uh, the you know we think the interface ends uh, with the knobs and the switches, but the 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 interface is really between ears and brain, and um, it, it's always about w what sticks out to the user, to the end user. Uh, what are they paying attention to? Uh, for me, a very good example is the difference between a chorus and a flanger. Hmm. They're both, they both wiggle the time delay around, uh, but we think of them as being very different devices. And really, they're not. It's just that 
when you increase the time delay a little bit, just a couple of thousandths of a second, what sticks out to the listener is the, the wobble in the pitch, okay? And that's what makes it sound like more than one person is playing at the same time. Mm-hmm. But you shift the time delay over just a couple thousandths of a second, and it, it's really, it's the same circuit, but those few thousandths of a second make the pitch wobble fade to the background, and the filtering effects yeah. stand out. Um, so uh, how our, our signal path affects what we attend to is, I, I think, is fundamental. I had the good fortune to, to have as one of my profs at McGill um, the wonderful Albert Bregman, who is uh, the godfather of what's come to be referred to as audio scene analysis. Okay. Okay? We only have two ears but there's a whole universe of sound sources around us. How do we, with those puny little two ears, turn that whole mess of sound information coming at us into uh, something that we can close our eyes and imagine there's this source and this source and that source, and they're all coming from over here or over there. He was, uh, I think, you'll pardon the pun, instrumental in getting me to focus on how we um, parse or organize the sound information arriving at us, um, what what, uh, rules, I guess, we might look for. and in many respects, that uh, I think that that's that's useful information for thinking about one's entire rig. And that's another thing. It's the whole rig. It's not just the pedal. It's the whole rig. And how they'll interact together. From and string yeah. to speaker to ears. <laughs> it's funny. It's it's cyclical then too because you're influencing how the rig is reacting based on how you're playing. And based on what you're hearing. So sure. it's not just start to end, it's a full cycle. Oh, and there's, and I mean, many people will tell you there's a, a, a lot of things you simply can't do without volume. Yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, yeah. and, and what, what the volume is not just what it does to your ears, it's what it does to that vibrating thing you're holding in your hand. It's vibrating more. The notes sustain longer. And that's longer. feedback you're getting as yeah. well as the vibration you're feeling, sure. whether whether you're actively thinking about it or just feeling it. And oh yeah, you learn to you learn to work it. Yeah, <laughs> I think uh, was it uh, is it Phil X? Oh yeah, of course. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, who uh, I think on a, on a recent episode of that pedal show was talking about, you know, you, you're working the amplifier. Okay, so everything leading up to the amplifier is determining how the amplifier responds, but the the volume level in turn determines what you're feeding it. That's that's very true. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's funny you mentioned Phil X. You mentioned that pedal show. I'm curious. Uh, I mentioned kind of in the intro when we talked about it a little bit how your name is thrown in the hat as a big influencer to a lot of modern pedal guys, even though in your own words you're not standing on the shoulders of giants, but teetering on the shoulders of giants who came before, um, like Craig Anderton. You've also mentioned before in conversations Robert Penfold, John Simonton. Um, yeah. So looking back, looking, let's say looking forward, um, are there any guys out there, are there any kind of so-called modern influencers that you think, that you follow or, or watch that you think are maybe going to shape the next generation there uh, I, I have to say that on, on the the diy stomp box forum yeah which started probably somewhere between 22 and 24 years ago uh, it was just an offshoot of the amp age forum wasn't it yes originally? it was yeah it was and uh but man there's so many so much resource in there oh absolutely and there's been so many um, people who who have uh, participated in it and and in some ways passed through it, uh, I guess because they 
they got too busy with their own business. Yeah, um, well, Brian Wampler is a good example. Brian Wampler, yeah, and uh, Brian Marshall from Sub Decay, uh, yeah. Zachary Vex from Zvex was yeah. uh, was a, a regular contributor. Um, someone they've all gone on to pretty great success. Absolutely, too. Um, uh, uh, Tone Barmentlu, who uh, has designed a number of the. Um, uh, tube-based pedals for electroharmonics. Uh, he was an active member for a while. Um, and there's a lot of people who, um, I guess, use handles that don't readily identify them or, or else they lurk. Yeah. Um, uh, that would be me. Yeah, I've probably well, read a thousand posts on there, and I've never, I don't even think I have an account. <laughs> <laughs> I just eat well, the information up. I, I was I was very surprised to find that uh, Joel Corty, who makes the, the Chase Bliss pedals, oh, yeah. was a, a fan, for want of a better word. I had never seen any indication that he was on the forum until I... I praised one of his pedals and boom I hear from him and I find out he's been uh, not stalking but uh, <laughs> but uh, read your material read my yeah. material uh, I had the good fortune to, to go to Summer Nam uh, two summers back uh, and was shocked at uh, the number of people who who s- say that they appreciate what I've posted um uh, Matt Farrow from Alexander Pedals, it, uh, Grant, now I'm blocking on his last name, from Big Ear Pedals, <laughs> um, Robert Keeley, when he saw my name badge, says, oh man, it's, fi- it's so great to finally meet you, come here, <laughs> I gotta give you a hug, and he starts introducing me around as the legend, and... <laughs> I'm oh, sure know. you found that fun. Oh yeah, I, I was. It was my ultimate comfort uh, point. <laughs> um, but no, there's a there's a lot of people who I suppose uh, would only know me by hanging around the Stompbox forum. And uh, as luck would have it, I, I have a big mouth and I post a <laughs> lot. And um, now that I'm retired, I have even more time to uh, open that mouth. I've got a fun anecdote story. Okay. From Steve from Demodash Effects. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. It's probably guy. from that NAM show, actually. No, that I think that might be from um, the Festival Sonor. Oh, last quite year possibly. In well, yeah. it, well, we'll see. Uh, so this is um, this is actually a post that Steve shared with me. Okay. So I'm, I'm going to read it as if I'm him just because it's in first person. Sure. Uh, I've heard so many stories of a scraggly looking dude coming up to people's tables at pedal trade shows and talking for 20 minutes or more, only for them to later learn that it was Mark Hammer. I always heard these stories, but it still caught me off guard when it actually happened to me in Montreal. So yeah, Montreal, (laughs) Sonora Fest, there you go. Um, And the quote goes, and the guys at these, at the, and this is you saying to Steve, and the guys at the Chase Bliss table over there all wanted to shake my hand and get a picture with me for some reason. Apparently I'm well known, but I have no idea why. Mm -hmm. I just spend too much time writing stuff on the internet. And uh, Steve goes, oh, neat. What's your name? Mark yeah. Hammer. Well, you know, they're not wrong. Do you mind if I get a picture with you too, oh. Mark? <laughs> <laughs> so well, it's, it's interesting. You, you, uh, it's interesting being a guy like you who has um, contributed. I know, you, I know you feel as though you get far more credit than you deserve. Uh, but being a guy like you has contributed and shared so much over the years. I don't know if you're, you know, the... Even though it's a, to you it's a little bit, it's a little bit so often for so long that there's just so much information out there now that uh, it, it, it's helpful to a lot of people. And I, I kind of wonder, I had a question here. Now I don't remember where I was going with it. But uh, yeah, you've, you've helped out a lot of people over the years. And what, what makes you, what sort of drives you to not just learn all the things that you're tr- learning and trying to get better at, but what drives you to want to be so willing to share it all the time? Well, because I've even experienced this myself. Yeah. Uh, this, here's my story of meeting okay, you. Okay, sure. I had never, I'd, I, I had started next gen and yeah. I was a cab guy. I didn't do a lot of electronics, maybe rewiring my guitar here or there, replacing a capacitor and a pedal to get a different sound. But I didn't know much of anything about signal chains and, or an understand, have an understanding of, 
of the, uh, certainly a circuit and a pedal. Um, and I remember I, I had heard your name and knew you were in town and someone said, oh, you should talk to Mark about pedals. And I called you up and said, hey, I got an idea for a cool pedal. And you said, great, let's go have coffee. And then, you, and then for an hour and a half or two hours, you gave me an introduction on how clipping works. And That's right. It was I like a, that. It was like a free, free lesson. I, I, I can't think of very many people who would give so much time and go into so much detail for someone they've essentially never met before. What, what drives you to have that kind of... Well, A, I have a big mouth. <laughs> but... Uh, I enjoy seeing the enthusiasm in people when when it finally clicks. Mm. Um, I used to teach university, and uh, there are, for me, there are a few feelings better than uh, that when you're looking at a out at a room of freshly scrubbed faces, and you can see all the wheels turning. In, in all the you know in all those minds and they're putting it all together and they're going, yeah, oh, I get it now. So I mean for me that's that's the thrill, um, and uh, and I have to say that in, in my in my band days, uh, I enjoyed setting up I think more than I enjoyed playing. <laughs> um, it was the idea that. You know, okay, I'm going to get everything ready, and it's going to be so good. Okay, um, I, I, you know, I probably got a bigger kick from putting down gaffer tape than than from having a, a ripping solo. But uh, the, I'll tell you, all the people that you share information with eventually do something useful and productive with it. And sometimes it's like, I, I, you have to think of it like an investment. I mean, there's so many people, for instance, on the Stompbox Forum, who started out as very naive and uh, completely I'm pretty sure untutored. we all do. Well, yeah, <laughs> so did I. And they're, you know, a year later, they're cranking out fabulous designs and they're, they're doing things that make you think, my God, where has this person been all my life? <laughs> so it's, uh, it, it, I get a big return on investment for the effort that I put out. Um, and it's, it's fun. And the other aspect is I have a pension. I had a decent paying job. I'm not trying to make money at it. I don't. I don't have to make money at it. Does that influence the way you think about it differently? I'm sorry, you, what? Does that influence the way you think about it a little differently? Because you're not sort of like a lot of times you get into an industry and you have to act and operate. In some ways, you have to act and operate a certain way to achieve success in that industry. But because you don't have any vested interest in that part of pedal building, do yeah. you find you think of circuits differently or look at things a little differently than you might if you were trying to make a go at it, so to speak? I don't have to protect anything. Yeah, that's okay. true. Uh, you know, I, I, I don't have any proprietary circuits to protect. Uh, I don't have any in investment to protect. Mm. Um, I don't have to keep anything private. Do you ever uh, worry knowing... Knowing what you know and how much work you go into to just as a hobby into learning it, um, do you ever worry when you divulge secrets of others, so to speak, that maybe they, maybe I shouldn't share this? Oh yeah, I, and 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 I hope I haven't. Uh, That's good. <laughs> you know the the uh, I what was it? Thirteen years ago. Mm. Uh, on a uh, on a Wednesday evening, I get a call from Bill Finnegan, who makes the Klon Centaur, and he introduces himself, and I I, need, I recognize his name right away, and I was wondering, you know, why the hell is he phoning me? And how did he get your phone number? <laughs> yeah, I I have no idea, but yeah. he he had some um, m mad skills uh, as far as uh, using the the net, and. Um, he wanted uh, he, he wanted to try something out on the Klon that uh, some customers had asked him 
uh, c- could you make it do a little more of this? And um, was asking for some assistance. Mm-hmm. Uh, Bill is not an engineer. I'm obviously not an engineer, but Bill is even less of one. Uh, however, he has great ears, just uh, remarkable ears. And um, he had designed the clone with uh, a consulting engineer who was tragically killed in a, a single engine prop plane crash. Oh, man. So he didn't have anyone to work with. And he said he had read many of my posts and he thought he could trust me. Um, he sent me two ungooped uh, Klon boards. He sent me a schematic. Wow. Uh, one of the boards had every single component socketed so that you could replace so you it could, with a yeah, different experiment. value. Yeah, that's smart. Um, and we worked together for about, I don't know, three months or whatever, uh, three, four months, had many long conversations. Um, in the end, I couldn't accomplish what he uh, wanted to accomplish, but um, I have not revealed the contents of uh, uh, more than what I've revealed now. Yeah. Uh, I sent him back the boards, I sent him back the schematic, and I take the secret uh, to the grave. Yeah. Uh, he That's... said he could trust me, and I, I value that. So yeah. I... I like I said, I hope I have not tipped anyone's hand, um, either it's, intentionally or unintentionally. Yeah. Well, uh, so it was a, it was obviously a challenging thing he was trying to accomplish. It kind of makes me wonder because I know we were talking at the beginning of this about how sort of hard it is to get started at, when you're first looking at doing this kind of thing. Um, after so many years of kind of tinkering yourself, are there are there still things you find that you're not so good at that you oh, have to absolutely. dig up some information on to refresh your memory, or just it's new and, and you haven't worked with it enough to? Absolutely. Today, before I came here, one of the reasons why I was here late uh, <laughs> was I th- just in the last two days started tinkering with relays. I had never worked with relays and. Uh, so I was making myself a little switching module uh, with relays. Uh, I also um, uh, am experimenting for the very first time with one of those uh, spin semiconductor FV1 chips. I don't know that they, one. Oh, well, at this point, they're old news, okay? Because okay. Uh, uh, Electroharmonics and Robert Keeley and everybody else have been exploiting them for... Oh, easily a decade in many of their pedals. Um, but I had never tinkered with it. And uh, so I'm, I'm finally moving into the 21st century. <laughs> and uh, I hope before the year is out, I'll get into working with um, picks. Uh, they're small. They're cheap. Um, and uh, you can make them very f- feature rich. There's a lot of things that you can do with picks um, that you simply can't do with, with analog stuff. Um, a fellow in Portugal uh, <clears throat> by the name of Tom Wiltshire uh, makes uh, a, a, a line of um, one chip solutions using picks uh, that goes by the trade name Electric Druid. <laughs> and these are just, they're little eight pin chips, okay, that will give you uh, different um, modulation waveforms, hmm. tap tempo, just, uh, you know, you throw them into a pedal and you've got a world of possibilities. And, wow. uh, I, you know, I'm sure companies like, uh, I don't know, Earthquaker and that, um, and lots of other companies are using them. Uh, Tom doesn't uh, make any pedals of his own. He just uh, works at the programming of these little things and sells the, the pre-programmed uh, chips. And there, he sent me a couple, and they're wonderful. Cool. Um, all right, rapid-fire question. Yeah. Comes from Tom McCullough. Okay. Talking about beginners and starting out, what... 
quick list. What are the most useful tools you think every beginner should have if they want to get into making or modding pedals and circuits? Okay. Uh, I think you need a, a, a decent pair of needle nose pliers. It's good to have some uh, curved ones mm. as well as straight ones. Uh, it's good to have... Smaller the better, too. Uh, yeah, <laughs> to get into those tight spaces. Uh, some folks like solder suckers. Uh, I prefer solder w a desolder wick myself. Uh, it can get into a lot of spaces that solder suckers can't. The braid you're talking the about. The braid, right? yeah. yes. Yeah, okay. Thanks. Um, I, I find it handy to have a, a little bottle of uh, liquid flux uh, hanging around. And you prefer uh, liquid over the paste? Yeah, I well, I use the liquid to uh, turbocharge the uh, the solder wick, the mm. braid. Oh yeah, okay. Uh, okay, yeah. you apply a little bit uh, on the the braid with uh, a Q-tip or whatever, and it it just it removes the solder like gangbusters. Mm. And of course, if you're starting out, you're going to make mistakes, right? So you need yes. uh, you need the braid. <laughs> Um, Have you made mistakes, Mark? Uh, I, I made a whole bunch this morning. <laughs> um, and thank goodness I had some braid hanging around and some liquid flux. It's, uh, it's handy to have uh, an X-Acto knife or some other small blade. Uh, if you're a beginner uh, or even if you're not a beginner, chances are pretty good that you've got some components that have been hanging around in your parts drawer for too long, or maybe it took three months to get here from Taiwan, <laughs> and in the interim have uh, acquired some um, oxidation, so, yeah, so the blade the will scrape connection. the tarnish yeah. off and make for a much better solder joint. Mm. Um, it's good to have a magnifying glass. No, some that's kind. something I never would have thought of. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, they make parts smaller and smaller and smaller these days. Um, and it's good to have good lighting. You'd be surprised uh, how easily the red band on a resistor can look like an orange band <laughs> and vice versa. Uh, or that uh, brown can look like purple. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's easy to make mistakes, and good lighting and good vision helps to uh, avoid them. Um, yeah, find yourself a good parts supplier. Uh, some are pricier than others, but more reliable. Yeah. Um, There's a lot of good ones, too. Small Bear in the U.S. is massive for pedal parts. Small Bear is wonderful. I'm proud to say Steve uh, Daniels, who, who is Mr. Small Bear, is, is a good friend. Um, I, there's places in Canada that I order from, yeah. uh, surplus houses used to be wonderful. They're harder and harder to find. Yeah. A little uh, less common these days. Oh, but. I used to, I used to be a, a, a patron, a dyed in the wool patron of active surplus in Toronto. <laughs> I don't think they exist anymore. There's a place in Montreal called Abra Electronics yep. that has a lot of surplus stuff. They have a lot of new stuff, but they have a lot of surplus stuff. Yeah. And sometimes you can find oddball oddball things, weird switches and weird pots and the Cool. Um Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. um any thoughts on like breadboard technique? It's an odd question, I know, but I should use it. Oh, you don't even And do I that. don't. Really? I I, <laughs> I and shame on me. I I mean I've got about four or five of them hanging around. Yeah. They sit there unused. Uh and I just go straight for the perf board. Yeah. Uh I'm I'm you know, the idea of the uh the, the padded perf board or, or just just a plain, plain phenolic uh and you just sort stuff. of solder leads together in the lines yeah. you need on the back? Wow. <laughs> yeah, I'm t I'm too impatient to uh, uh and it's it's my my weakness. <laughs> I'm too impatient to build something first on perf board and confirm and then it, it and then transfer it to, I mean, oh, on a breadboard and breadboard yeah. <laughs> and then transfer it to uh something else. I I mean and very often uh, I'll, I'll, I'll make a, if there's a layout available, I'll make the printed circuit board and, you know, etch it and drill it and tin it and build the thing just to hear how it sounds without <laughs> ever once going to, uh, 
to breadboard. Wow. Uh, and the result is I have a, a, a couple of bins of unmarked circuit boards that have all the components sitting on them with bare wires hanging off of them, and I have no idea what they are. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. Oh, man. Um, I, I, I got to uh, – so I'm, I'm, I'm almost a little sad because – you're one of the things you're sort of legendary for, so to speak, is your snazzy coveralls. Oh, I, they're in the laundry. I'm <laughs> sorry. I, when I was coming here, I thought, oh, God, how will people know it's me? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not wearing the coveralls. Um, yeah. Where they're, do you get those anyway? <laughs> uh, funny question. <laughs> Funny answer. That's from Mark, by the way, Fun, not from me. Yeah. <laughs> funny, funny answer. So I had bought some. No, let me start this right. <laughs> Every time I see somebody wearing a piece of clothing I think is remarkable and very distinctive, I'll say, geez, you know, I, I, I love your shoes. Or I, I, that's a great sweater. Where'd you get that? Thinking, oh, they're going to tell me where I can purchase one myself. And the answer will always be, Something like, uh, oh, these, I got these in Chile, okay? <laughs> or, oh, yeah, 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 I bought these when I was, you know, traipsing across Morocco or something. So it's always somewhere exotic and foreign. Okay, so I buy these overalls at Giant Tiger. <laughs> nice. And for $9. Wow. And uh, That's actually a really insane deal. <laughs> it, it is, yeah. Because uh, the second pair cost me $90 at uh, Tractor Supply. <laughs> but uh, so I have these overalls, and I'm at a conference in Nashville. And on the final day, uh, as a social activity for conference attendees, they uh, were supposed to take us all to the Country Music Hall of Fame. And I thought, okay, you know, when in Rome, do as the Romans, right? So yeah. I, put, I, I put my uh, overalls on. And on three separate occasions on that day, women came up to me and said, I just love your overalls. Where'd you get those? <laughs> and I got to say, as the exotic guy, $9, giant tiger in Canada. <laughs> <laughs> you can't buy them. <laughs> you too. <laughs> That's hilarious. Uh, Mark, I, want, I appreciate you coming so much. Oh, it was a thrill to be here. Thank you for the conversation. And uh, maybe, hopefully, we'll do this again sometime. I I'm hope sure. So. I'm sure people who, uh, certainly a lot of our guys who are into pedals and such, uh, will, will probably want you back because they'll tell me, yeah, you should have asked them this, 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 and this. But, well, you wouldn't have had enough uh, memory space uh, in yeah, the camera, true. I think. But uh, there's always another time. All right. Well, thanks for coming. And Thank if you. you're watching or if you've watched and listened, Thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. Have a good one.